Well, hey, uh, good morning. I, I truly am glad to be here with you this morning. Um, again, my name is Lance Sandy, one of the associate pastors here at Outfitter Church. And uh, whether you've joined us to exalt Jesus or, or really to explore Jesus this morning, uh, we truly are grateful that you have chosen to be with us at Outfitter Church. And so uh, back in November of 2023, uh, we began a new sermon series uh, on what is called the Apostles' Creed. And so we have been kind of working line by line uh, through this creed, and, and what this creed really is, is a summary of the core beliefs of the Christian faith. And so as we have been in, looking at this creed for about four months now, that, that's what we have been really looking at, is the core beliefs of the Christian faith. And so Christians universally throughout history and all over the world today have pledged their allegiance to the truth that, that is in this creed. And so we have said this many times from, from the pulpit, hoping that it would stick in your minds and heart, that, that you can actually believe more than what this creed states because there's more to the Christian faith, but you can't believe anything less in order to be a Christian. Because as Christians, this, this is the God that we believe in. Uh, this is the gospel we proclaim. This is the church that we belong to and have fellowship with in our lives. And so we've been working through this creed. However, today we have come to the end of the Apostles' Creed. And as I thought about sharing that with you, I, I, I probably thought that some of you are probably going to be glad we're done with the Apostles' Creed, that yes, we're, we're, we're here at the end. Uh, it's, been, it's been challenging for your pastors as well to preach through, through this sermon series, uh, preaching topically definitely has challenged us. But hey, today we're going to look at the final words of the Apostles' Creed. And so as we have done from the start, uh, let's say this creed together one last time this morning. And so here, here it is. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This is the Apostle Creed. So as we look at its final words this morning, I thought that final words, they, they really are Im important to us in our lives. They carry an amount of weight with them in our lives. Final words from a beloved grandparent or a beloved parent, maybe some final words from a key leader or mentor in our lives. Final words cause us to lean in and listen carefully to them, oftentimes sticking with us throughout our lives. The same is true in the Bible. Final words are extremely important. They carry an amount of wisdom and blessing for us in our lives. Like King Solomon, in, in all his wisdom, his final words that he had to say to the world was that when all has been heard, the conclusion of the matter is this, fear God and keep his commands, for this is the whole duty of man. The last book, the, the book of Revelation, its final words to us says, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep what is written in it. Last words really do deserve our full attention. And as we come to the final words of the Apostles' Creed today, we see some staggering last words. I mean, it says the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. If you thought the forgiveness of sins was good, that 
the life everlasting and the resurrection of the body is even better. This is a monumentous reality for every believer's life here today, that our, that our bodies would be resurrected from the grave, raised to life everlasting with God. And so this is what our end is. This is what lies ahead for us. And you and I need to know that just as true as the start of this creed is, that God is creator of heaven and earth, so are its last words. And so this morning we're going to be looking at this truth in Scripture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. So if you have your Bible, please turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. And so if you don't have a Bible, please know there are some Bibles on the inside chairs of each row. Uh, feel free to follow along there, or you can follow along on the screen behind me. Uh, if you don't have a Bible at all, please know that we have a lot of Bibles, and it, it's pretty heavy uh, week in and week out to carry them all in the tote. And so please take, take, some, take a Bible home. But we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. And this is, this is the truth that we find in Scripture. This is what God's Word tells us, starting in verse 13. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, in the same way, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For we say this to you by a word from the Lord. We who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are still alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so will we always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Pray with me this morning. Father, we do thank you so much for carrying us through the Apostles' Creed. And Lord, helping us as a church together to look into your word at these truths that it tells us. Father, I just pray today as, as we look at its final words, the, the final truth that it shares with us of the resurrection of our bodies and the life everlasting. God, that you would just comfort our hearts in this. That you would just help our hearts to believe this truth. That you would help us to live in this truth daily in our lives. God, we just ask that you would lead us this morning as we continue to worship you through the reading of your word, through the preaching of your word. Father, we ask all these things in your name. Amen. In these verses that we have just read, we see that every believer in Jesus, whether dead or alive, has a certain future. In a world that is uncertain about everything, we who believe truly do have a certain future. The Apostle Paul writes these words here to the church at Thessalonica, whom he dearly loves. During his second missionary journey, Paul came to the city of Thessalonica, and once he arrived, he began to reason with the Jews there that Jesus was the Messiah. And some of the Jews were, were converted, but a large number of God-fearing Greeks were converted along with many prominent women in the city. It was as if there was a revival taking place in Thessalonica. These were real men and women like you and me who were of different ages, ethnicities, social status, who were choosing to turn from a sinful life to believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, committing their lives to serving and worshiping Him. But, at, but, but shortly after, the Jews who were not converted became jealous. They began to attack 
these believers, and ultimately it led Paul and his missionary team to be separated from this church. However, despite the severe persecution, persecution, a real church was planted in Thessalonica, one that was an example to all the other churches in the surrounding region in their region. The Thessalonians were the cream of the crop. They were known for their ever-growing faith in the Lord Jesus, brotherly love that extended far and wide in their inspiring endurance in their faith. The Thessalonians believed that Jesus was coming back during their lifetime. You and I would, would see them as a church that, that is crazy today, that, that, that is believing that Jesus was coming back in their lifetime. But Paul the apostle praises them for their great expectation. In pressing forwards full speed ahead, they produced many works and eagerly awaited for the Lord Jesus to come back for them. But as they waited, and as you and I wait today for the Lord Jesus to come back, the inevitable takes place in our lives. Right? Taxes must be paid. Time continues and death comes. At some point in this church's life, some brothers and sisters passed away. And those who, who remained alive, they were heartbroken. They, they were wondering what would happen to them now if Jesus comes back today. And so Paul writes these words here to comfort these, this church at Thessalonica. And the first thing that, that he writes to them and points to them is that they have a real hope in death. And so the first thing that, that I want us to see this morning in verses 13 through 14 is that we have a real hope in death. In verse 13, Paul tells them this, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are asleep. Paul's concern for the Thessalonians was that they were uninformed. And this word uninformed here means to be ignorant, to not know, to be unaware of. And they were uninformed about those who were asleep. Paul here in using this word asleep is speaking about those who are dead, specifically fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, fellow believers. But this, this wasn't just two or three f believers who had passed away. This word asleep here is written in the present tense, which refers to an ongoing occurrence. Like, like soldiers at war, these Thessalonians were losing brothers and sisters one after the other. And it was devastating to them. As death often makes us think, they were thinking it wasn't supposed to happen like this. And as, as the cycle of death has continued in our world, many remain uninformed about it and what, what comes after it. Because of its existence, some doubt God's existence. Some, some believe all those who are close to them who die automatically just go to heaven. Others say things about the end that God has actually never said about the end. And some don't give death and what comes after any attention, and some just simply lack knowledge. Really, what, whatever the case may be, the Apostle Paul here sets an example for all of our lives in writing this sentence. I mean, he, it, it tells us that if Paul does not want us to be uninformed, it tells us it's important for us to be informed, for us, for us to not, that you and I would not remain unaware of eternal things in our life. We aren't to remain unaware about death and what comes after, and we're not to remain unaware of what happens when Jesus comes back. 
Listen, one of, the two th one of these two things is going to happen in your lifetime, just like it happened in the Thessalonians' life. And so this, this knowledge, this truth that Paul is going to speak to us, it's so valuable for your life. It's so valuable for our walk with Christ. And Paul also shows us here that for us who do have this knowledge, that it's important for us to help those who don't. Right? It, it, we should be helping them grow in the knowledge of the truth, especially other believers. Listen, Paul is not leaving this church behind because they're uninformed. He actually moves towards them, and he begins to speak the truth to them. He sees their need, and he humbles himself to serve them for their good, for their maturity, for their growth and understanding in Christ. And that's who you and I are supposed to be as, the, as disciples of Jesus. We're, we're supposed to be those who, who are informed and then, then inform. We're to be those who, who take in truth and then pour out truth. I didn't tell our, our deacon Trent that I was going to be sharing this story, but just this week, our deacon Trent Featherston and his wife, Sarah, had some Mormons come to their house. And instead of ignoring them, ignoring the doc knock at the door, instead of opening the door and, and telling them they're good, they invited them into their home and shared the truth with them. They, they, they were moving towards them to inform them of the truth. Listen, there, there's some of you here this morning that know you need to grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And you need, you need someone in your life like a Paul who would be willing to serve you and to disciple you. There's other, others of you who, who you know through conversations that some of us need to grow. And you need to be moving towards a brother or sister in this church to disciple them. And so Paul sets in a great example for us in, 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 in starting in this letter by writing to inform these brothers and sisters. So who, who are you moving towards in your life? Who's the Paul that you're moving towards to? Who's, who are the brothers and sisters you're discipling in this church? Paul here is moved to write to these Thessalonians about the truth of those who were asleep so that as he tells them, so that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. Paul's burden was, was that their lack of knowledge was beginning to lead the Thessalonians to grieve over the dead like those who have no hope. As he says, like the rest, that, that means like unbelievers, those who don't believe in Jesus. And Paul wants to tell them here and comfort their hearts saying, You're, that's not you. you. You have hope. You have a real hope. And so what Paul begins to do here is he begins to make a stark contrast between believers and unbelievers and points to their difference in hope. This, this word hope, as many of you may know, but some may not, it is not wishful thinking. It's not, I'm hoping something will happen. The, the word hope here is a desire for good with the expectation of obtaining it. In other words, it, it's the assurance of the future being good. Hope in the Bible speaks of assurance, not wishful thinking. And so Paul says here, unbelievers have no hope. And so for, for unbelievers in this life to them, those who die that they love are lost forever to never be seen again. That in looking at the end of the tunnel for them, they only see death. They may speak of some good future to come or, or may think happy thoughts, but, but the reality is they have no hope. They have no solid foundation to think or to believe these things in their life. 
because they still have not turned from sin in their life and believed in God's Son, Jesus. John 3, 36 says, but the one who rejects the Son will not see life. Instead, the wrath of God remains on him. Before God, they have no hope, no good thing to look forward to, to receiving from God. But Paul tells the Thessalonians, that's not you. The word of God is telling me and you this morning, that's not you. You're not one who has no hope, but you are one who has a real hope. One that, that is a solid foundation. One that, that is bring, should bring us assurance knowing our hope is rooted in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a real hope in Jesus Christ this morning, church. For Paul tells us in, in verse 14 here, for if we believe, which, which can also be translated, since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, in the same way through Jesus, God will bring him those who have fallen asleep. And so since we believe, and not just because we believe, but because Jesus really did die, and Jesus really did rise from the, from the grave, you and I have hope in him. Jesus came, came into this world and, and he put on flesh, and in doing that, he identified himself with us sinners, making it very clear to us that he came for us, and that he not only died the death that you and I deserve, but but he defeated de death rising from the grave. And so Paul tells us that the one we have believed in, he's, he's not dead, he is actually alive. And so in the same way, in the same way that Jesus was completely dead, three, de three days in the grave, and then on the third day rose again, all those who die in faith in Jesus Christ, their bodies will be raised from the grave. Their bodies will be resurrected to life everlasting. And so this is, this is a comforting hope because there's some of you in the room this morning who know of some very beloved believers in Christ, brothers and sisters who have passed away. And yes, the truth, the truth of the gospel is that once they die, their spirit does go be with the Lord. But the hope that we have is we're not just going to be in fellowship again with a spirit. We're going to be in fellowship one day again with the real brother and sister we used to know. That their body, we're going to, we're going to see them for who they truly were. And so Paul here, Paul here is comforting the hearts of the Thessalonians with the hope that we have in the gospel. And so, but it's not just for, for those who are dead. Paul here is really calling these believers to a hope for them as well, that they have a hope right now as they live. And so really, really it's a call for you and I to not only to know the gospel, but to daily live in the gospel. And so the gospel isn't just for when we get saved. The gospel is for every moment in your life. It's, it's for the moment when, when you lose a brother or sister. It's the moment when, when you're grieving in your life. It's, it's for the moments of, of that you have joy and peace in your life. The Lord Jesus came, came and gave us a solid hope to stand upon no matter where we're at and no matter what's going on in our life. And so no matter what, whatever circumstance you're, you're, you find yourself in this morning, in Jesus you really do have a real hope that daily you can look to. You can look to Him 
and your heart be comforted and assured that that, that that good is coming in the end, that there really is the resurrection of the body that is coming. And so church, this morning, what God wants us to see and is calling us to in our lives is not to just believe in Jesus for salvation, but, it, but it's to walk with Jesus in our daily lives, looking to him the hope that he gives us. It's the hope of the gospel that will wipe away your tears. It's the hope of the gospel that will take away grief in your life. And so Jesus, Jesus is our hope. And so Paul here, he, he continues writing, and he not only gives us and points us to a real hope in our death, which is our Savior, but he also points us to a certain word for the future. And so he, he points us to a certain word for the future in verses 15 through 17 here. And in verse 15, he, he, he writes this, for we say this to you by a word from the Lord. And so as Paul is, is actually writing this letter, the Lord Jesus gives him a word of revelation on how this all is going to take place in the end. And so it's important for us to really stop here and, and know how we can really trust that Paul received a word from the Lord, a revelation from Jesus on how this all will take place. Because if you've ever encountered Mormons or if you've ever encountered or, or listened to any videos on YouTube, you know there are people in our day saying, I, I've received a revelation from God. I've received a word from the Lord. And so how do we know what, what is a word from the Lord and, and, and what is not? Well, when, when Jesus came, Jesus sent out 13 apostles. And so an apostle is an, is an eyewitness of the Lord Jesus Christ. They, they, they are an eyewitness of his life, of his death, his ministry, and in, in his resurrection. And Paul here is an apostle. He is one who has seen, who is an eyewitness of Jesus Christ. On the road to Damascus, the Lord Jesus came to Paul and knocked him off his feet. The Lord Jesus blinded him, and, and then, God, then Jesus sent him out to, to use him as an instrument to proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles. And so in Paul writing this, Paul is an eyewitness of Jesus Christ. And, and when the Lord sent out the apostles, he sent them out to lay a foundation for the world, to lay the gospel as a foundation in the world. Jesus had come and preached the gospel, but Jesus didn't go any, anywhere and everywhere, so he sent out 13 men to, to proclaim the gospel. In, and in doing that, he also sent the Holy Spirit to empower them to do that. And so just as you lay a foundation for your house, right, that you don't need to lay a second foundation. Hopefully, at least hopefully you don't. And, and the same is true in the Lord sending out the apostles. They laid a solid foundation for the world to know the gospel, the way of salvation, the teachings of God. So there, there's no need for another word in our life. Because God, because God has actually given us a greater teacher than the apostles. God has given us the Holy Spirit in our lives. So God doesn't need any more apostles to be sent out because he's got a body now that's full of the Holy Spirit that can go and teach and proclaim the gospel in the world. And so we, as the church, have the complete revelation of Jesus Christ, of God the Father and the Holy Spirit in, in the Bible, in what they have written in these words. And so when someone comes up to you and says, I have a revelation from the Lord, I have a word from the Lord, if it doesn't line up exactly with what this word says, then they don't have a revelation or a word from God. And so 
it's important to know, to, for us to know that this truly is a word from Jesus. This is really a, a, a word, a revelation of how the end is going to take place. And when you think about that, it shows us just how much Jesus really does care for us. It really does show us just how much Jesus wants to comfort our hearts and assure our hearts that he is coming back for us. Because Jesus didn't have to give us the details here. The gospel is sufficient enough for us to know that he's coming back, that, that we will be resurrected to life everlasting. But he gives us all the details here. And so really we see just how much God really does care for us and want to comfort and assure us. And here, here's the certain word for the future. It says, we who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. And so the comfort that you and I can know in what lies ahead as a believer in Christ is that none of us are going to be left behind. Is that those of us who are alive, we don't have an advantage over those who are dead, and those who are dead don't have an advantage over us who are alive. Jesus is coming back for all of us. And so they, the Lord tells us in his coming, certainly those of us who are alive will not precede those who have fallen asleep. He also says in verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice, and with the trumpet of God. If you think about when Jesus first came for us, Jesus came quietly. Jesus actually came very cautiously. Right? Jesus was born in a manger in Bethlehem and lived out in the middle of nowhere in the town of Nazareth. And for 30 years, he stayed quiet. He, he stayed under the radar. And as he, as he did it, and as he, as he did, fulfilled his ministry, Jesus did it so cautiously. And many times he, he told people, don't, his disciples, don't, don't tell them I told you this. Don't tell them who I, who I really am. And so Jesus, when he first came for us, was, came in a very quiet and cautiously way. But here we see that in, in Jesus coming for us again, it's the exact opposite. He actually comes with a shout. Jesus actually comes with the voice of an archangel. He comes with a trumpet of God. In other words, Jesus is excited to come back for you. Jesus is excited. He can't wait for this day to, to, to come back and to raise your body from the dead. Many, many, uh, many times whenever I, I uh, come home from a trip or uh, if I come home just, just from a long days of work, I'm the most excited to get home. And I'm, 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 I open the door, I'm like, kids, I'm home. I walk up to Brianna, honey, honey, I'm home, I'm home. And most often I'm more excited than they, than they are in me arriving at the house. They, they definitely love me, but, but the excitement in the home is, is me. And oftentimes, when, when I think that's often true for our lives too, when, when we look at Jesus coming, we find, we see right here, Jesus is actually more excited to come for us than we are for, for, him to, for him to come for us. And so, I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but Jesus, man, he's excited. He can't wait for this day to be with you, church. And that, and that should cause your heart, maybe this morning, if you, if you may not feel that Jesus loves you that much, that Jesus, maybe you've had some sin this week and some doubt. Man, you can look right here. This is a word from him he's telling you. I'm coming with a shout. 
all of heaven is, is waiting for this day to, to, for you to, to be raised from the dead and to be with me. But Jesus also tells us here the, the exact way it's going to happen in the end. He says, and when he comes with a shout, it says, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are still alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. I can remember when, when I first uh, was married to my wife, Brianna, early on in our marriage, we had a family uh, reunion. And we were going uh, to Rusk, Texas. If you've never been to Texas, specifically Rusk, Texas, it's, it's the backwoods. And uh, it's, it's, it's deep East Texas. And I remember going to the family reunion, not really uh, that excited. And when I got there, I, I was surprised to see just how many people were out in the woods. I mean, this was just an just a average home but man, there was probably 30 to 50, 50 people there. And come to find out, uh, granddaddy had, had about 12 brothers or sisters. And so it's a big, it's a big family. And I was, and if you know me, I'm not, I'm not the, the most extroverted person. Uh, I'm a little bit more introverted. And so I was a little nervous about being around so many people that I've never met and I've never been around. But as I, as I stayed there, I began to, to enjoy it. I began to, to enjoy the fellowship, though, though the fellowship was, was a little, little different, a little backwoods, it was, it was a lot of fun to be and to get to know my family's, uh, my, my wife's family. And so what Jesus really is, is giving us a picture of here and what's gonna happen in the end, is this is gonna be a big family reunion that all the dead in Christ will rise first. And so this, though this will happen, as, as Scripture says, it'll happen in the blink of an eye, every believer who has died, who has put their faith in Christ, will rise from the dead. I mean, you're going you're gonna to get to see these first Christians at Thessalonica be risen from the dead. But, but it's also going to be you and I raising into the air to be with them. That we're gonna, we're gonna be joined together once and for all. And so it's gonna be this, this big family reunion that I can tell you, you're not, you're not gonna wanna miss. And so this morning, as, as, you think, as you think about, as you think about the hope that you have in death, maybe this morning, you, you've never really thought about death too much or, or really what would come after. Or maybe you've never really thought about what your foundation is in your hope. And for us who, who believe in Christ, I want to just comfort you with what the Lord has said here. We have a solid foundation. We have a real hope in Christ and a certain word for the future. But as, as the band comes up to close us out in a final worship song this morning, maybe you're here this morning and you would say, man, I really don't have a solid foundation for the hope that I, that I think of, for the hope that I believe in. And maybe this morning as, as you've listened to God's word, as you've looked at scripture, maybe, maybe Christ has convicted you to put your hope in him. That instead of entrusting in yourself, in in, instead of entrusting in happy thoughts or good thoughts, that you would really trust in someone who has laid a, a solid foundation for you to have hope, to know that there is good for you in the future. And so if that's you this morning, I just want to give you a time to respond to Jesus. That in, in, your, in your own way and in your seat, that, that right now you would, you would confess to Jesus that you need him.
The way this passage ends in verse 18, it says, therefore encourage one another with these words. And so in other words, as, as we continue to live our life as Outfitter Church, if Jesus doesn't come back, the reality is death, the cycle of death will continue, even, even in this church. And so God has given us a clear word to encourage one another with. And so as, as we continue to, to worship Jesus, to live our lives for Jesus here, let us, let us take this truth that we see in Scripture and encourage one another daily in the hope that we have in Christ. And so that's a real way that you can begin to disciple one another and live out the example that Paul sets for us in this, in this text. And so wherever you're at this morning, I pray that you would look to Christ, that you would look to Jesus because He's the one who can only provide you a real hope in your life. And so if you're, if you're wanting to accept Christ this morning, I wanna just say a prayer, lead you in a prayer. And afterwards, I wanna pray a prayer for our church. So pray with me this morning. For the one who wants to put their faith and hope in Christ. Lord Jesus, I come to you this morning. And Lord, I acknowledge that I have been trusting in myself for, for my hope, for my hope for the future. Lord Jesus, today I, I acknowledge that there is no hope without you. Lord, today I give you my life and I believe that you died and rose again for me. Lord, comfort my heart and assure my heart of the future and the hope I have in you. Listen, if you, if you made a decision to trust in Christ today, would you please come let Pastor Tyler know, myself know, or you can fill out one of the connect cards, but we wanna know that you've, you've decided to trust in Jesus and come alongside you and disciple you and walk with you in your new relationship with him. Father, I just thank you so much, Lord, for your word. God, for the truth and the hope that we have, that we find in it, that it points us to you. God, may, may you comfort our hearts as you can only do today, Lord, through your death and your resurrection. Lord, let us be a church that encourages one another with these words and help us to stand firm in, our, in them no matter what happens in our lives. We ask all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.